and I went back to Washington and I selected the member of my staff who was on my staff having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington but she was on my staff to pre see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. Uh, she was um, level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. But I did explain to her that she couldn't possibly cover 50 years of handwritten minutes in two weeks. So she would have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods of time to concentrate on. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees meeting for the first time raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909, they raised the second question and discuss it. Namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? They answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. And, the, and then that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education, which is, could be considered domestic, be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation, and that portion, which is international, should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent 
teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is, will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat? So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, if, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber. Will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London. And there they're briefed into what is expected of them when, as, and if they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume book study the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. That's the story that ultimately grew out of and, of course, was what could have been presented by the members of this Congressional Committee to the Congress as a whole for just exactly what it said. I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey was concerned was she never was able to return to her law practice if it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away in a job with the Federal Trade Commission. I don't know what would have happened to Catherine but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it. Terrible shock to it's, it's, it's a very rough experience to encounter proof of these kinds. Mr. Dodd, what kind, uh, well, can you summarize the, the opposition to the committee, the Reese Committee, and particularly the efforts to sabotage the committee? Well, they began right at the right at the start of, uh, um, of the work of, a, of an operating staff, Mr. Griffin. Well, wasn't the White House involved in opposition to well, the not at, 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 not at this particular point, sir. Mr. Reese ordered counsel and myself to visit Wayne Hayes. And Wayne Hayes was the ranking minority member of the committee as a Democrat. So we, counsel and I, had to go down to Mr. Hayes' office, which we did. Mr. Hayes greeted us with um, the flat statement directed primarily to me, which was that I am opposed to this investigation. I regard it as nothing but a, an effort on the part of Carol Reese to gain a little prominence and, and um, so I'll do everything I can to see that it fails. Eventually, I had occasion to add to my staff, and as a result of adding to my staff, a top flight intelligence officer 
both the Republican National Committee and the, and the White House were resorted to to stop me from continuing this investigation in the direction that Carol Reese had personally asked me to do, which was to utilize this investigation, Mr. Griffin, to uncover the fact that this country had been the victim of a conspiracy. That was Mr. Reese's conviction. I eventually agreed to carry it out. I explained to Mr. Reese that his own counsel wouldn't go in that direction. He gave me permission to disregard our own counsel. And I had then to set up a, an aspect of the investigation outside of our office, more or less secret. And um, the Republican National Committee got wind of, uh, of what I was doing, and they did everything they could to stop me. They appealed to counsel to stop me, and finally they resorted to the White House. Was there objection because of what you were doing or because of the fact that you were doing it outside of the official auspices of the committee? No, their objection was, as they put it, uh, my devotion to what they call anti-Semitism. That was a cooked up idea, but and, in other words, it wasn't true at all. But anyway, that's the way I expressed it. And um, excuse me, why and did they, they made it stick. Why did they do that? How could they say that? Well, they could say they, they could say it, Mr. Griffin, but but they had to have something in the way of a, of a rationalization of their decision to do everything they could to stop the stop the completion of this investigation in the direction that it was moving, which would have been an exposure of this Carnegie Endowment story and the Ford Foundation and the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation, all working in harmony toward the control of education in the United States. To secure the help of the White House in the picture, they assigned, uh, the, they got the White House to cause the um, liaison personality between the White House and the Hill a major person to go up to Hayes and try to get him to, as it were, actively oppose what investigation was engaged in. And Hayes very kindly then would listen to this visit from a major person. Then he would call me and say, Norm, come up to my office. I have a good deal to tell you. I would go up. He'd tell me I've just had a visit from a major person and he wants me to break up this investigation. So I then say, well, Wayne, what did you do? What did you say to him? He said, I just told him to get the hell out. And he did that three times, and I got pretty proud of him in the sense that he was, as it were, b backing me up. And we finally embarked upon hearings at Hayes' request because he wanted to get them out of the way before he went abroad in the summer. And... Um, but why were the hearings finally terminated? What happened to the committee? The hearings were terminated. Carol Reese was up against such a furor as Hayes through, through the activity of our own counsel. Hayes became convinced that he was being double-crossed, and he put on a show in a public hearing room, Mr. Griffin, that was an absolute disgrace. And he called Carol Reese publicly every name in the book, and Mr. Reese took this as proof that he couldn't, couldn't continue the hearings. Um, he actually uh, invited me to accompany him when he went down to Hayes' office and in my presence, with the tears rolling down his face, Hayes apologized to Carl Reese for every done and his conduct and um, apologized to me. And I thought that would be enough and Carol would resume.
but he never did. The charge of, of uh, anti-Semitism is kind of intriguing to me. What, uh, what was the basis of that charge? That was charge? there any basis for it at all? No, the basis that the Republican National Committee used was that the intelligence officer I'd taken on my staff when I, when I oriented this investigation to the exposure of and proof of a conspiracy was known to have a book, and the book was deemed to be anti-Semitic. This was childish, but this was the second in command of the Republican National Committee, and he told me I'd have to, I would have to dismiss this person from my staff. Who was that person, sir? Who was that person? The person? Yes. A Colonel Lee Lorraine. Lee Lorraine. Yeah. And what was his book, do you recall? The oh, title he, of his book? He'd, uh, the book they referred to was called Waters Flowing Eastward, which was a, uh, a very castigation of the Jewish influence in the world. What were some of the other charges made by Mr. Hayes uh, against Mr. Reese? Oh, just, just that Mr. Reese was... Uh, utilizing this investigation for his own prominence inside the House of Representatives. That was the only charge they, Hayes could think of. How would you describe the, uh, the motivation of the people who created the foundations, the big foundations in the very beginning? What is or what was their motivation? Their motivation, well, let's take Let's take Mr. Carnegie as, uh, as an example. His publicly declared and steadfast interest was to counteract the the um, departure of this of the colonies from Great Britain. He was devoted to just putting the pieces back together again. The foundation's allegiance to. Uh, to uh, these un-American concepts, all traceable to the type, of, to the transfer of the funds uh, over and into the hands of trustees, Mr. Griffin, that um, not the men who had a hand in in the creation of the wealth that led to the endowment of, or as a use of that wealth for what we would call public purposes. It was a subversion of the original intent then. Oh, yeah, completely so. And that we got into the world traditionally of bankers and lawyers. How do you see that the purpose and direction of the major foundations has changed over the years to the present? What is it today? Oh, 100% behind uh, meeting the cost of education such as such as it is presented through the schools and colleges of the United States on the subject of our history has proven our idea, our original ideas to be no longer practical the future belongs to a collectivistic concept and um, there's just no no uh, disagreement on this. Why do the foundations generously support uh, communist causes in the United States? Well, because to them, what communism represents a, a means of developing what we call a monopoly. That is, the organization, we'll say, of, of large-scale industry into an, uh, an administrable unit. Do they think that they will be one of they the administrators? Will be, they will be the beneficiaries of it, yes. 